Welcome everyone to the weekly jail call. So far we have Michael D, Michael C, Dan L, Dan B, Jan B, and Goran. Hopefully others will trickle in. And we've uh, got a few topics to discuss, but uh, Dan L, it sounds like you are having issues with Home Assistant. What can you tell us about that? I had some electrical work done, and so I installed something called a green eye monitor, which basically allows you to collect data about how much current each circuit is using. To display that data, I was using a, a Home Assistant module provided specifically for GreenEye. In recent versions of Home Assistant, uh, starting in about June, this module broke. And it's because they upgraded to a newer version of Python. If you go and look at the issues raised with the Home Assistant provided GreenEye module, you, <clears throat> pardon me, you'll find a link to a third party GreenEye module which works. It's going to take a while to get the real the the home assistant provided module to modified so so it works. But in the meantime, and probably for the foreseeable future, I'm using this other one, which has a better interface to it anyway. It actually provides um, a, a GUI interface, whereas the home assistant from uh, the Home Assistant provided module is command line only. Basically, you you put it in configuration.yaml and then you, you don't touch it again. Um, so I've got my grasp working again, and um, I recommend the new module. Do you have links for either GreenEye or the module or both? Drop them in the chat if you could. I will. Thank you. How did you install Home Assistant? Did you install it into a virtual environment? No, it's running under Beehive. This meeting is being recorded. Welcome, John. Um, in that case, it's probably if you're running the appliance inside Beehive, it's a problem of dealing with the uh, and seeing uh, Docker Compose set up. Yes, yeah, well, it. it, it, it it's a module provided by Home Assistant, and the problem is in that module. Yeah. All but right, so... at that point, it's not really a jail-related problem. Agreed. And I thought I said at the beginning that it's not really jail-related. OK. Or um, not that's that's cool. It's all fair it's game. Is this possibly a Python two to three migration issue, which has been on uh, less people? Three point nine to three point ten or eleven. <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah, I've seen a lot of those. Cool. Anything else to help uh, Dan with that? Oh no, this time? No, I'd love to. Okay. Wasn't looking for help, just something to talk about. Oh, uh, shoot us some links. Oh, we, oh, I've got yeah. buckets of topics, but uh, I do want everyone to bring their hottest topics yeah. to the I'm, table. I'm grabbing the links from my oh, perfect post in in progress. Just gotta awesome. get all logged. In. Uh, Daniel B, do you have any topics? I know you'll be traveling, and hey. Sorry, I'm not outside. I was waiting for a truck to pass. Uh, nothing, nothing in particular jail-wise. Though I, I, there are two uh, pieces of documentation by uh, attendees of this meeting that I really loved. Jan, your uh, your bridging notes. No, I, I do have a question. I do have a question about that. And then Antoinette, your your Linux jail uh, notes. I think are the best since. 2018. I've been using a set of Linux jail notes uh, from shell user. I don't know who that is, IRL, but uh, uh, but from the FreeBSD um, forums. 
And Dan Triggs, because your, your new documentation, I think, is a big jump for it. Well, we'll definitely take the compliments, and I've got the three links on the screen. Uh, you can I can drop them in the chat if it's really necessary. But yeah, uh, Jan and Antrenik have been busy at work with blog posts and produced great results. So can I ask a question about uh, a TSO? So L LR, uh, for, for Jan, in, in the uh, bridge documentation, um, you suggest tuning the interface uh, to drop uh, a TSO and yes. and just just and just out of it just this is entirely out of experience. It's not out of there's no brain power put into into my decision. But I haven't been. I found an enormous uh, 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 performance penalty if you fail to disable LRM, which I believe is automatic in most cases when you create a IF bridge device, but is not the case uh, when you use a netgraph bridge. But TSO, I haven't seen a performance hit on account of that. Uh, and I'm just wondering what your reasoning was. I mean, theoretically, it does make sense to drop it. But TSO, and I, I don't know if I should uh, mention, uh, in case anybody doesn't know, LRO and TSO are both um, different different um, uh, optimizations for, uh, for traffic management through interfaces that go to hell sometimes when those interfaces are shared with multiple virtual network so, devices. Um, the short version why they go to hell is that they both do the same, just in opposite directions. TSO is for transmission. So what it does is that the host basically generates giant 32 or 64 kilobyte uh, jumbo <clears throat> frames and then passes these down to this network card and the network card will expect them to contain TCP packets and reformat them into multiple segments. And LRO does the same in the opposite direction where basically you receive your 1.5 kilobyte uh, packets and the network card slash firmware will collect those up and rewrite them into giant packets as long as they belong to the same TCP connection. The problem is that these break down when you have to um, look at the packets as they are for firewalling and other inspection duties, especially bridges. And what really is also painful about it that they break down and TCP will back off until it's so painfully slow, like acoustic coupler levels of slow, that the threshold for the offloading to kick in is no longer met. Basically, the timeout to wait for packets to aggregate will expire between each packet so that they get passed up or down unmodified. So basically... Even SSH is basically unusable, but you can use it to recover with patience. And that's the most common way I have seen it break. And I just disable it because it has failed me in the past. And it depends on your specific implementation of what works and what doesn't. Uh, but Do the problem is... That it really does make a difference. It really increases your CPU overhead to disable those. Test it. As I stated, I don't have an authoritative source telling me what exactly works. It's just that I've seen both break, routing, nothing, stateful packet inspection, and bridging. So I disabled them and on my networks right now, it's not a performance problem, and I rather have it work with a few more you, CPU cycles wasted than figure out what exactly can be re-enabled because I'm not CPU cycle limited right now. But so, what do you think? Do you think there's a there would be a reason why why LRO why why when that's enabled, it's like Hello, it's of so course, because, obvious. Um, yeah, it's so obviously. I mean, it just destroys the the inbound traffic, and 
but yeah. or, or or yeah or vice versa and i i and but T, tso wasn't as apparent for me do you know why it would be more obvious with one rather than another um, and do you know why it's a I problem for example doesn't... if the traffic on the way out of your system if you're also running a firewall and right. basically suddenly the traffic coming in on the lro disabled interface doesn't match the state on the way out if you're really forwarding because right. on the way yeah. out the packets get aggregated and suddenly the state isn't in sync and uh something like pf will say no 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 i have to reassemble that and right. there's nothing to reassemble and basically it will block forever trying to reassemble these packets and they will always get out in big batches again and get broken up or you so, should... some... so just so is it a what so should we consider it a bug that if bridge doesn't doesn't disable LRO on the physical. I'm sorry, it does. It actually does disable. Yeah, LRO it doesn't disable TSO, phase, but it doesn't. It doesn't disable. So is that a bug? Should we? Is that something we should submit that it doesn't disable TSO? Um, it depends. There are configuration where it can work, I assume, but not all of them. And so I just recommend it to turn it off. Okay, just and then actually ensure quick... that it works. You can try. To see if it works. The other thing is, if everything is going through the bridge, and the CPU is already uh, wasting cycles uh, looking at each frame before it gets aggregated, TSO can't really help you much after what you have already lost the cycles. All right, so that that might be theoretical as to yeah, whether or not so... it's a bug. But uh, you... checksumming shouldn't be a problem unless there's a driver bug. Yeah. So maybe you want to set the SUSCTL to disable checksum offloading on the vidio net uh, guest driver. You can do right. it via SUSCTL system wide for all VT net interfaces or uh, just per interface using IF config. Uh, again, oftentimes you want this offloading because it does work for a host. But as soon as you have uh, anything but uh, an end host inside your system, you have to give up some of these offloading features. Right. And Antronik, you asked a couple of weeks ago, I remember, like, when is this situation when you don't want to use a, a VNAT device? And this is, I think, for an edge for an edge router that wants to take advantage of these uh, these um, features and not having a bridge at all is the way to, to solve that. So not having a bridge at all? Yeah, not having a bridge at all. Like if I, if it's an edge router, it has all physical oh, interfaces, yeah, you don't need a bridge. Uh, but you might need jails, in which case you would do, uh, you know, a, a do a non jail. Router. Uh, so it's often faster to just have uh, uh, an extra loopback interface and announce it into your routing protocol. So let's say right. you announce a slash 64 or a slash 24 or whatever works for you uh, to your loopback interface. Uh, or even with VNet and ePairs, you can have your routing daemon, something let's say BERT2, um, re-announce all direct connected interfaces matching some pattern like e pair star a and then your routing daemon will just announce all of these interface words uh, into uh, ospf or whatever you're using but that assumes that your entire operations team is familiar with dynamic routing which is often the problem Right. Yes, it is a problem that you have an operations team. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh -oh. The problem is that you have to find staff which basically know the network and the hosts. We which don't even know part. the static routing. Um, that assumes a very static network. <laughs> uh, one... you... Go ahead. Static rocket networking, uh, static routing in a static enough network can be good enough. 
Jan, you mentioned it breaking up larger frames to the 1500 MTU. Is so that it in the situation? aggregates them yeah, to okay. even larger virtual fake frames so that the host network stack only has to process the headers once per 64 or 32 kilobytes instead of uh, per 1.5 kilobytes. So it basically reduces the effective packet rate the network stack has to process. And most of the packet processing overhead is per packet headers and not per uh, byte of payload. So you really can realistically gain, gain an order of magnitude of network throughput per CPU cycle. Just as you would if you had uh, the MTU raised to these levels, but that doesn't work on real networks. So it's just, yeah. So I guess just to clarify, the user is not increasing the MTU. The hardware is doing it to uh, to, to attempt the, to do the right thing and speed things up. Yeah. Okay. The hardware and firmware and driver collaborate to have the network stack deal with imaginary packet headers to reduce the CPU load. And this works great if you're running something like a big FTP server or something. Uh, then it's exactly what you want. Okay. So put, Any other uh, insights on the handling of TSO and LRO on virtual devices, bridges, you name it? Um, I wrote which sysctl you can use to disable LIO uh, for all VTNet interfaces. I have entered that into the yeah. here, and I'll even make it a fancy courier to look all systemy. And I also heard a compliment about your WireGuard post, perhaps. So uh, mm -hmm. in case you missed it, Jan wrote a lovely post about WireGuard integ integration in 13.2, and it sounds like you got that working on 14 after you ran Etsy update. Um, uh, I haven't tried yet. I didn't have the time. Got it. That's okay. But uh, people like Baptiste were rather impressed saying, hey, where's the where's the review for this? That looks great. So I'm Yeah, the review is punch this done in yet here. because I didn't have time to test no, it on my test system. So yeah, I'm uh, relying on I'm relying on the bad RC uh the the um you know, the, the, the RC D version, the default one. And it's, you know, it's awful. I'm already developing bad habits around that. And yeah, Jan's, Jan's is quite good. So I'm looking forward yeah, to that. The yeah. Sadly, it uh, has the dearest honor of okay. being the longest RC.D script I've ever seen. <laughs> and then it's after I uh, reduced the, and removed the shell check and so on. Uh, Mike, because... Michael, please click on the here button. The here okay. button? Uh -oh. yep, there's a... yeah. Mm -hmm. SH available here, right before uh, TLDR. Yeah, ba, 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 ba. hold the on. Last blue, I'm losing my uh, mind. Here. There you go. Ah, let's go for that long stretch. And and point being, this does not rely on any, sorry, let me scroll up, any third-party packages, correct? Neither third-party packages, and I also uh, made sure to avoid uh calling out to commands which may not yet be mounted. Okay. So I don't pipe things through SED or invoke ARC anymore instead of the first version, which invoked ARC a lot and so on. Instead, I did do what's possible with shell built-ins. And you documented it? Are you crazy? Yeah, that's one of the reasons why it's so long. And I also <laughs> implemented error handling because the ugly thing is that if you create an interface, it can succeed in the interface creation, but fail to give it the name you want it to have. And then I implemented a stackable undo mm -hmm. so that it basically, the setup steps document what they're about to do, and then they undo it if they get interrupted by someone pressing uh, control C for sick int or something because they're impatient. And then it undoes the setup steps. The teardown, of course, doesn't bring the interface back up. So the undo is only in the setup direction. 
And yeah, okay. That is a beast. I'm impressed. <laughs> Still so, going. Okay, great. Yeah. And so, uh, so can we can we put this into base? What do you guys think? Uh, you can just drop it in and see if it works for you. But it would be nice if someone tested it on a clean uh, current system. Because uh, on my test system, I had a messed up slash ETC. Yeah. Where I didn't run ETC update always. So it was... I don't trust that that it's not a false positive if the bug I found where basically load KLD fails despite the kernel module being already loaded or maybe it's that the syntax changed and there's a polar violation in 14 and all ports using RC.D uh, required modules uh, where we'll have to be aware of this. Yeah. So, Anjanik, to answer your question, please test this on every version you can think of, with, if anything, 13.2 and 14. 13.2 but... and you are... Well, so, yeah, I it... didn't understand the part where the ports and the modules... What, what's going on there? Okay, um, if you open it up again and look for required modules... Here I state that it requires um, the if underscore wg uh, from the wg kernel module. And okay. this is just a magic variable which rc.sapre knows to pass and then it will make sure that this kernel module is uh, loaded on demand. To make okay. sure that it's... I, mean, I know what it does. And I wrote it for virtual OSS. And that's exactly why I'm asking you. I have something that I'm kind of maintaining. So what, but, what's the, the change? Uh, I don't know what changed in 14. Uh, but for some reason, the say, this works for 13.2, but doesn't on my 14 uh, lab box. I'll have to make sure that it has a clean uh, slash etc. And then confirm that there is a bug. And then after, if it is, I have to run it again in sh-x to see what it's doing to find the bug. But yeah, works in 13.2, uh, oh. does not work in 14 as of a day ago. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, please, uh, if anyone has a clean 14 system, just ready because my... Uh, Bimetal test machine is right now busy. Right. And you say that could just be user error, not a fault. In it the could be, direction. but it doesn't have to be. I have to look into it. Yep. Hey, or one of the wonderful participants of this call. <laughs> awesome. If anyone wants to give I it a spin. Do we Michael C., what was that? Uh, do we know if Wildcard works in the even better. So if you go back to uh, Jan's blog, uh, uh, Michael, you should have a look at the first uh, blog post that he posted. So that would be, what was the title, Jan? I think it was... Uh, well, I got name... configuration for 13.2 plus. So let, let me drop the link. This is so the one link from the wire guard or link from the other? Okay, thank this you. This is the older post and... So th there was one that where you were running WireGuard as the only interface inside the jail. You remember that? Oh, no, that's, that has, hasn't been written up. Oh, uh, that, that hasn't been written. You only that's showed may, probably in okay. the, uh, around, uh, maybe here in the minutes. And But what I did is uh, I have my jail.conf create the uh, WireGuard interface, configure it, and then assign it as the only interface to a VTNet enabled, uh, sorry, VNet enabled jail. So that the jail, and the nice thing is that because WireGuard, before it was ported by the original auto to FreeBSD, even had support for Linux network namespace it, it also brought this support to FreeBSD, which means that the sockets are created using the credentials, uh, which were used to create the interface so that even after you move the WireGuard interface from one jail or from the host into a jail, it 
stays in this VNet for even for future sockets, which means that you can have a wire guard uh, overlay where the jails are not even in a way able to address the outside underlying network. You can only use the wire guard. So, for example, if you uh, have one of these so-called privacy uh, VPN hosters, which offer WireGuard, you can use it to uh, mirror your favorite YouTube channel, and YouTube doesn't know your uh, external IP address. And the jail has no way of leaking it, not even via DNS, because it can't address your internal network and its DNS resolver. Or... Basically, inside the VNet jail, you would have uh, only two interfaces, uh, right? Wait, the LO0 and... It does uh, have its own loopback interface. And WG0, then that's it, yes. right? And, but and, it and, does not yeah. have access to the underlying, underlying net network. network. Yeah. But uh, you have to watch out. The super user in the jail can change the WireGuard configuration. Uh I found no way to lock down the WireGuard configuration interface from the super user inside the jail. And that's because it's done using iOctals on and not uh, going over some kind of device node I can. So instead it uses uh, iOctals on a socket, I think. Uh, and these aren't jail. There's no way to mark the interface as only let your configuration be modified and your private keys read out and so on from the trusted device. So for example, in theory, the root inside the jail could dump the configuration and destroy the interface or reject it and then uh, or bring it down or whatever and then run a user space uh, WireGuard implementation because it's UDP over whatever network it still has access to, which in my case would be none, <laughs> to then run their own uh, malicious WireGuard node, but the attack surface is a bit esoteric. But your point is a jail could have strictly a WireGuard interface and no yes. others. Interest. Yes, the loopback nice. and the WireGuard interface, completely isolated for at least anyone but root who can still run the WireGuard commands on the interface, but you don't have access to the underlying network except wow. for the WireGuard, which is really neat for isolating workloads. Let's say you uh, have for, to uh, access some um, questionable content to after a compromise or something, you can make sure that whatever happens, even if you uh, need network access to the internet, it, the jail, even if it's the runtime inside it, so it's compromised. So let's say you have to run some kind of compromised application inside there, yeah, where you really know that this thing is malicious. It still can't even address your network. It can only take its default route over the WireGuard interface. Um, and and by the way, this is this is as far as I know not specific to WireGuard because I've seen a configuration like this with VXLAN as well. I don't know if you can split the if you can specify it using VXLAN, there, but what you can do to accomplish the same is have a VXLAN to really very tightly isolated run the VXLAN outside, add it to a bridge. Add an e pair to the bridge. Just don't put an address on the bridge. Just set it up, and then um, hand the e pair to the ah. jail. That way, and now and now the same way. The, the jail doesn't and bridge have access. Are yeah, outside of the untrusted jail, and the, if you really want to take it to the extreme, the it doesn't have to be the host. You can have a dedicated network. VNet jail, which holds this. So you can have your host system, your network jail, and then your workload jail. Hmm. Mm, that does work. But otherwise, I don't know if you can split the basically 
I think GIE has support for it, but I don't know for sure. Uh, and with basically, TUP can do it in a way because the TUP interface is in the VNet, yes. but the TUP device node, which is used to basically read the Ethernet frames and encrypt them, for example, using OpenVPN, is, is then um, in another jail or on the host. Because, but that's a special case similar to Beehive because the top interface is both a character device and a network interface. And you can put one in one jail and the other in another jail. And that just works because it doesn't have to be a rare because the other end is in the network interface. So that's that you can also do it at home. So Michael C, you're super quiet. Sorry to say, can you, do you have any way to get louder? Uh, sure. So Please you check your microphone to... selection. Yep. Yeah, it might be the wrong mic, as the points out. Yeah, hold on a second. Uh, let's see. And can you hear me? Much better. Okay. Yeah, so I want to add that uh, also work for physical interface. I actually use SRIOV for gels. Uh, you can also add an uh, interface to a running gel ad hoc. You don't oh, yes. have to do it in gel config. So and the way you do it is to... simply if config vnet and then interface name, and then you can move that interface to the gel. But yeah, you're I, limited I, I, to I... 64 oh, one at time. or however many uh, interfaces you're... But well, Jan, that's yeah. device specific as, as, as yeah. we have seen no, a while back. No, the limit uh, of SRIOV. That's not... Oh, I see. That's a oh, hard limit of how many virtual function a physical function can have in PCI. Because yeah. two or three calls ago, me and uh, me and uh, Jan did that on the call on the recording where we did boot up a device where a single interface ended up being uh, sixty five interfaces. The main one IXL zero and sixty four SRIOV virtual functions. And uh, all, the, all of the 64 could be passed to a VNet, basically. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a question because I'm not a hardware guy, apologies. So this SRIOV thing seems very interesting. Um, does every modern NIC support that? Or is it like very specific to very specific NICs? Or is it, or, um, or is it specific to NICs? Sorry. I think it depends on what kind of next you play with the most. For example, the Aquantia or the Real Tech, those they, they don't have it. But if you play with more um, server focused next, say the Intel's and the um, Chelsea's ones, they all support uh, SIOV. Uh, I think the old uh, Manios one does not support it, but the new one should support. Uh, but I haven't played with the newer Manios one. I've played with the Chelsea ones, so they definitely work. The Intel ones, they also work. Uh, the Intel ones mostly is the Intel 10 gig or upper one. They support uh, SRIOV. The uh, i350 is supposed to have SRIOV, but as far as I know, we don't have the driver support for uh, that particular one. So to take advantage of SRIOV, you need from the top, to, you need a driver supporting SRIOV on the card. You need a card and firmware which supports it on a main board which has the feature enabled, on a main board which has the feature and hardware, including a CPU which has the right feature set. So you need uh, on Intel machines, you need a VTD. I think on uh, AMD, it's called something VMM. I think it's AMD5 or something. Or AI? Yeah, AMD, AMD VI or something like that. Okay. Yeah. I it's think it's oft AMD oftentimes a problem that um, the lowest end um, budget mainboards don't even have it often. The better ones often have it disabled by default, even on supposedly server boards, sometimes disabled by default. So you may have to go through there and then make sure. And sometimes at least Intel has been known to cripple their overclockable parts of a K suffix and then re remove the VTD support, at least up to, I think, Haswell and Broadwell. I don't know about the newer chips. They're still doing this 
stupid stuff to in the, in the case of the overclockable part it was supposedly because this was the first thing which failed during overclocking the uh uncore so <laughs> and you could run the chip faster if this feature wasn't available another noob question so when you enable the virtual functions does that mean that like is it splitting the speeds? Is it what well, like what, mm. what, what what are the side effects of enabling SRIOVs virtual functions? Depends like, on like, your like, card. Yeah, it depends on the hardware implementation. Yeah. On a really good card, you dynamically share the maximum available bandwidth with each virtual function able to theoretically reach wire speed. Hmm. On oh, uh, a cheaper card, you may be limited to, if you run the maximum number of virtual function, to one receive and one transmit queue per virtual function, like on the older Intel cards. Then uh, if you have eight virtual functions, you have eight queues and per direction, and suddenly uh, you're running single queue on a 10 gig NIC, which means... Uh, in this case of the old, uh, what was it, the, the one before the Intel 520, the second generation Intel 10 gig make, where if you enable it, um, you're lucky to reach barely four or five gigabits on a high core count, low clock speed CPU because you're limited by single thread throughput. But the NIC in total can totally uh, run at line rate. It's just that you don't have enough queues to at reasonable clock frequencies push 10 gig through the card. You mean the Intel A2599, right? Something like no, that. No, the one with the 89 something ES. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's the, the same, older same one. one. Yeah. Yeah. Also, yeah, on... uh, yeah, also nice to know sometimes, uh, I think the Chasio one, I haven't uh, actually do a lot of testing. Mm -hmm. If you enable SRV, there's some interesting features. I think they can do a lot of like uh, offloadings. I even think I saw blog posts uh, sometimes that you can, uh, let's say you have a 10 gig link, you can actually have more than 10 gig uh, VM to VM uh, Maybe... over SRV, but I'm not sure if that's true because technically you have to wish that. for the Ethernet. So some cards, I don't know if FreeBSD support this, supposedly, for example, can do VLAN isolation that a car basically a virtual function is required to tag its frames with a specific VLAN or maybe even a set of VLANs they're allowed to use so that you yeah, I, I think you can at least lock that. down the cards so that the virtual functions can't spoof their MAC address mm -hmm. that is supported by some cards in FreeBSD uh, on that it's, topic it's, uh, Jan, what, what, I'm not sure who answered, asked the question. This is John. I have some VMs, um, not jails, running uh, SRIOV with 100 gigabit cards, mm -hmm. and the the IO you get in the in the VM is astounding. Uh, is the IO between two virtual machines on the same host higher than the link data rate? On a 100 gig card, yeah, I can. They'll they'll bump up to 25 gig easy. 25. Gig. Gigabit or gigabyte? We're on a 100 gigabit card running in SRIOV VFPF mode. Yep. 25 gig is just a quarter of line rate. That's correct. Which is. But that's a, but that's a four cable, that's a four line cable. Mm -hmm. On that topic, uh, if you have two jails on the same host, that can communicate together over ePair, what should we expect their maximum speed to be? Uh, 10 gigs? More than 10 gigs, but it basically you're limited by packet rate more than um, bandwidth. So you're basically limited to this many millions of packets per second. So if you, on this fake link, increase the MTU to 9K, you're available bandwidth in synthetic benchmarks like hyper free scales almost linearly with the um, MTU. Size. So uh, on my home machine, quite loud power at home server, 
with default packet size, I'm getting like uh, five, six gigabits on an e-pair on an otherwise loaded system. And with raised MTU, I'm hitting 16. Oh, you're hitting 16 on 9K MTU? Yes. 16, that uh, is... 15, 16 gigabits a second using the synthetic benchmarks. Like that... iPhone 3. Uh... That is fascinatingly good. No, it isn't, because, because... Uh, ePair is limited by the, at least in 13.2, by the fact that it's doing all of its processing in one uh, network thread in the kernel. So oh. it could be a lot faster. And I think Christoph has been working on that. So check in 14, it may be that it now uses all cores. Use it with the, there was some discussion about having uh, it use either. I, I think Christoph's work was so, on the so bridge. That it should scale a lot better and then it, you could have hit the full CPU bandwidth of all cores using a single e pair. So at that um, but point, I, we are talking hundreds of gigabits. I, I but I think Christoph's work was on the bridge, on if bridge, not on if e pair. No, but I might be wrong. He worked on the bridge first, and that part has been committed. And now okay. the e pairs on the bridge to connecting the VNet enabled jails. Suddenly, the bridge is fast enough, so in aggregate, multiple ePair interfaces can have great throughput, but okay. each single ePair is limited to one thread of throughput. Mm -hmm. Got it. So That's kind of funny that have we have to create 16, multiple ePair uh, interfaces. Let's say you have 16 VNet enabled jails connected to the same bridge each with one uh, end of an e pair on the bridge and the other in the VNet, uh, together they can far exceed the packet rate of this setup I okay. tested. That's, uh, that is, no, no, okay, that would be a lot more fascinating indeed. Um, uh, which brings me uh, to a, a question about that. So um, uh, if, if we have an e pair jail that's connected to a 10 gig, so the bridge also has a 10 gig. Should I expect a 10 gig from the jail at the moment? So what is your exact configuration? So a jail with VNet that has ePair that is okay. attached to a bridge that is attached to an external NIC that is 10 gigabit. Okay. Should I expect the VNet jail to reach 10 gigabit? External. Depends on your CPU speed. Uh... Yeah, okay. Basically, it right now it depends on the single threaded speed of uh, your what an EPR can do. Exactly, you're hitting the yeah the limit of lacking multi queue operation per VNet. Uh, sorry, per EPR. Yeah. I was tempted to, uh, if you want to experiment with it, you could use the link aggregate driver for a static link aggregate. What? Well, you aggregate multiple e pairs using uh, one of without uh, LACP. So, uh, that could work using something wait, like. Wait, wait. You're saying I should do lag inside a jail? Lag between multiple e pairs to basically fake multiple queues. That could so, work around this uh, bottleneck. So, so my jail would have my single jail would have multiple e pairs that that would be lagged. Oh, okay, that that's that could that's... work for a system with lots of flows. You would good get good load distribution for a single flow. It doesn't help you. Would that be LACP a... or a different like link aggregation uh, protocol? Either LACP or static. Okay, thank you. But the same. I do not know anyway. what the static is. It's the same driver, just in a different mode. Okay, got it. Which, yeah, which, it but, 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 which, which means if I really want to reach the ten GB, uh, PS, I could use SRIOV, right? Just SRIOV yes. on the external link and pass that. So that brings me to a good question. That I, so uh, apparently you were not impressed with John's twenty five gigabit on his hundred gigabit. So my question is, if I have two jails. On SRIOV, if I have two jails on SRIOV, when they talk together, 
is the network going out and coming back N of the physical machine? Or is FreeBSD smart enough that that it, it would really not be FreeBSD, it would be the network card. Network card, know. yeah, sorry. Okay. Does anyone else know? I think, well, I think it would be going through the network card. Uh, it is but, It is going through the network card. But does but, it go out of the interface to the switch and comes back? Uh, no. Is it basically no. A, a switch inside the, the NIC? The, yes. It is switched internal to the NIC. Okay. And this is, that's where I, I asked because I hope that would be the case if anyone knows if the bandwidth of the internal switch exceeds the link data rate so that you could, let's say, push 20 gig internally inside the 10 gig NIC. For any the NIC. answer is yes, you can exceed the, the link rate. Nice. Like, it var is, it varies like, um, by load and configuration. Okay. I wouldn't. I would not. I would not state an absolute number. Okay, but you have seen it happen. Yes, sir. Yes. So the so the blog post I read is correct. You have a link to that I, post. I am typically running with a uh, with a MTU of nine thousand. Yeah. So uh, one thing to watch out for if you run with MTUs above two kilobytes is that. Um, you can suffer physical kernel heap fragmentation so that you can no longer allocate large physically continuous buffers to grow your mbuff pool of large mbuffs. And then suddenly your network stops working, which is what I've encountered at least in FreeBSD 12. I think For the Chelsea cards, there is a, uh, a setting that uses the MTU 9000 via uh, 4K blocks. But that only works because this card uh, supports Gather Gather DMA. Mm -hmm. and I'm, but... I'm just making a comment. I'm not stating <laughs> it <as> generic. <laughs> it's just something to watch out for if you, for example, uh, are limited to your onboard Intel 10 gig decks, which don't support this, at least not with a FreeBSD driver. I don't think they support it at all in hardware. <coughs> you have to pre allocate your. MBUFs or limit yourself to smaller MTUs. <clears throat> okay, and other points more. on this and discoveries, because that's that. Yeah, I, I want to go back to the Please. earlier topic. It's like, do we know how all Illumos like crossbow they deal with the IPv6 uh, situation? Like, obviously, in our situation, right, uh, we don't, we can't really have our jail to have. Uh, have tons of IPv6, but also bridge together. Obviously, that's a, has some performance impact. I thought that's what uh, we had talked about earlier. It's about the uh, the best practice is have the IPv6 address on the bridge itself instead of in the VNet jail. And no, not at all. To have the IPv6 or any other IP address for the same networks instance. So. But the the VNet enabled uh, jails would be connected using the e other end of the okay. e pair in the other instance of the network stack, which is what a VNet basically is. Okay, so that would basically that VNet would filter the address and everything, so we are good. But you wouldn't. The problem is really only one end of the e pair is a member of the bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Unless you put both in, in which case you created a loop. Right. So in a VNet jail situation, do we put the address in the VNet jail or do we put the address on the bridge? Both, probably. The host has its address on the bridge. The VNet enabled jails have their addresses on their e pairs. Okay. So. A VNet enabled jail is its own IP stack. Mm -hmm. So it has its own interfaces and its own addresses and its own routes and its own firewall and so on. Yes, uh, but I'm thinking about a situation where we breach the, a physical interface, but as mm -hmm. well as a tons of e pair inside. So won't if we put the IPv6 no... address on the host, 
then the packet will get consumed by the host instead of getting forward to only the if both systems claim to have the same address, which is in this configuration, uh, which IPv6 uh, duplicate address detection is supposed to prevent. So basically, the before a system is supposed to use an address, uh, it's supposed to use duplicate address detection no. to basically ask a multicast group if uh, someone else has already claimed this host ID on this link, and then uh, you learn if your IP address is basically already in use. Of course, for example, on a router or firewall, you may want to disable this because otherwise any uh, joker could come around and take down your system by just claiming that I'm the default router. Right, so uh, because I'm reading your blog post, mm -hmm. so it says the IP address belongs exclusively on the bridge interface itself. Yes. So I'm a little bit confused. Like now we say we need to put in the both places, but they are well, supposed to be in the same IP six the... scope. The blog post only concerns itself with the host. Okay. So basically preparing the host, uh, let's say you had multiple Ethernet interfaces for some reason, because you have a quad port gigabit NIC in your server, and you're running the most inefficient switch in the building. Okay, that makes sense. And then because you I was thinking put about the IP situation. addresses on your individual ports, because then you get the problem that from the network stack point of view, each of the member ports would become, as soon as we have an address, they become a link scope where you have, and suddenly the member ports are no longer part of the bridge's link scope in the IPv6 point of view. Mm -hmm. So, okay. uh, and then basically it doesn't, things like, uh, neighbor discovery and solar router advertisement so long, uh, apply to the wrong scope. And mm -hmm. IPv6 just disintegrates e even worse over time because normal things like um, ha having some neighbor cache entry timeout and then get repopulated no longer work then. Because so what the happens is, is that uh, basically you learn that it's this inter address is on this uh, other link where you didn't ask about it and didn't care about it. Mm -hmm. So as long as in the same VNet, uh, yeah. they don't see it in, they don't see the IPv6 address in the member and on a so separate interface, that's fine. Let's look at the two uh, common use cases for this. The one is VNet enabled jails, which is totally on topic here. And there, uh, the ePair members, which would get added later via jail.conf and the jail command, um, the ePair would be created. Um, one side, let's say the A side of the ePair, would be added as member interface. And the, it must be up because otherwise the member port on the bridge is down. <laughs> but it gets no address assigned on the A side. The B side of the ePair would be moved into the VNet. And there it would be inside the jail, configured up, IPv6 enabled, uh, router advertisement acceptance would be enabled as well. And then the RT Soldi, for example, would be started. It would ask for an address and would assign it. This is, does not violate what I intended to say because the B side of the ePair is its own interface and not the member port, which is mm -hmm. a bit confusing because it's all virtual and all inside the same physical machine. But logically, it's basically its own network. Yeah, I yeah, got it. I, interface I think, I think... and network stack and host on the network. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I just worry about and... like in this previous situation, if the bridge consumed the packet. So mm -hmm. as long as that's not the case, that's fine. Yeah. And the other part is if you run Beehive, you would add the TAP or the MNET interface to the bridge. And that would, again, be configured up, but not assigned an address. But 
inside the beehive process, which opens the character device to read and write Ethernet frames, it exposes mm -hmm. this to the guest as a VIRT.io net interface, which in turn is then um, used by the guest network stack to get its address. But again, there is no member interface with an address. The member interface is the top network interface, not the character device used by Beehive or some other hypervisor virtual box or something. Mm -hmm. I hope that makes sense. It's really, you have to get your model right and then it starts making sense. And otherwise it's very confusing because there are so many parts and you have to be pedantic because the fine details matter. And, um, yeah. a, a silly question about that. Yeah. Can can I P V six? Uh, let's see. So you, you have a machine. It used R T. What was it? R T Soul. I remember correctly. It That's used a one shot command with a D suffix. Yes. It's the demon doing it in the background. Yeah. Or R T Soul D in mm -hmm. order to uh, receive an I P V six address. But mm -hmm. I cannot use uh, RTADVD in order to uh, like tell my internal network, for example, my jails to use that. Oh, you can. Um, uh, but, but but do I have to specify the the the? Do I have to specify the network that I got in RTVD dot in RTADVD dot com or? If you have statically uh, assigned addresses on the interface, it defaults to the first one and just builds its, uh, it will say, I'm the default rotor, I'm having medium priority, and um, the prefix part, so the first half of the IPv6 address you're supposed to form is mm, the first half of my first IP address on this interface. You can assign it if you have multiple ones and you only want to announce this prefix. And you let's say you also have a, you have your global unicast and your unique locally assigned on there. And you only want to announce one of them so that your other nodes don't learn about the ULA by default. But you still want to have it present. That's possible. Does anyone want to make sort of napkin notes visuals on these? Because yeah, getting that all those relationships right, this has been a challenge for at least one of us. Um, not just and, one. It's a yeah. I lost a lot of time figuring that out. Yeah, well, do keep documenting it however you see fit, and please do check my syntax in the uh, document. I tried to follow you as best I can. Yeah. Um, but having oh, and. The IP always assigned by the jail or VM is logically similar and quite helpful. But go ahead. Which, which, saying, which, which, which means, Jan, technically, if I have if I have RT Soldi enabled and I have RT ADVD enabled, not on the same different. system normally. Not on the same system normally. Why? Um, because the IPv6 status auto configuration only gives you a single an address on a single interface. It doesn't give you the addresses you need. You can configure FreeBSD in such a way that it does work kind of on one interface. It's only supported in this special case via one RFC, uh, which is mentioned in the rc.conf man page because I don't have the RFC number uh, off the top of my head, but it's something VAN CPE interface so that you can have a router with route advertisement acceptance enabled, but that's just one unusual corner case configuration. I think it's used on DOCSIS 3 networks, so okay. I can't lie so, piece. So, so let me put it another way. So I, I, have, I have a FreeBSD machine 
mm-hmm. that has an internal network, which is, let's say, jails or other internal networks. Yes. I do not know what my exact external IPv6 is. What I don't know what my IPv6 is. It's not static. My ISP is going to send it to me okay. over router advertisement. Yes. What should I do in order when the machine boots to get an IPv6 on that router and also mm-hmm. advertise to my internal network so they can also get an IPv6? on a default out-of-the-box FreeBSD machine? So um, this is an open problem. It's basically similar to the small network multi-homing for IPv6. This is an open problem. It's not well solved because uh, the IETF, for good reasons, still proclaims that not, especially IPv6 not uh, is evil and must not be standardized because it's so evil that we pretend that it hasn't been already implemented by some vendors in some way. But so NUT isn't really supposed to be the answer. What you're supposed to do is use DHCP v6 prefix delegation to obtain the prefix you then announce on your internal network and yes every time you would uh, your external prefix changes let's say daily on your home internet connection you're supposed to automatically renumber your whole network using dhcp v6 basically the dhcp lease would expire or be worked you get you obtain a new prefix, you revoke the ah. data advertisements by announcing one with a lifetime of zero okay. three times, so that as almost every system will have uh-huh. have the so, so so you're saying that prefix it's not done revoked, by the... and then you announce a new one and your systems are just supposed to change that, and then you mm-hmm. would have to dynamically update the DNS. So you're saying that should not be done with RTSOL and uh, RTADVD but rather uh, with a DHCP v6, for example, with DHCP um, CD. No. You would use RTSOL D on the router. Intermediate router. Instead, yep. the intermediate router would uh, be a DHCP v6 prefix delegation client, but okay. it's very possible, or that I'm using it, to, that way to have the base system route advertisement daemon mm-hmm. then running on the interfaces you're using the delegated prefixes on. So you would obtain uh, a prefix with, for example, DHCP uh, client daemon from ports okay. and use a DHCP script hook uh, to um, advertise the router to okay. uh, add, use the RT what's it called RT RT ad, uh, RT no, no, this command oh. to uh, and add interfaces as the, for example yeah in your bridge creation whatever okay script. Uh, oh, but, okay but but but, 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 but what network. is so, so you're saying the problem is that RTSOL D or RTSOL doesn't do prefix delegation. That's why I can't use the base system out of the box. I have to use the exactly. ATP v6. It only gets you okay. an address, A address on the local interface there. Okay. On the interface, on your upstream interface, but it doesn't get you an additional prefix you can use okay. on other interface to then announce it. Hence, why we're merging, hopefully soon, DHCP CD into base. Yeah. Okay, well, now we're I understand. Not. We're Shall not we merging get... DHCP CD? Well, have you seen any movement on the, the, the review? I didn't see anything. I mean, that, that that's usually something for Michael or Uncle Dave to go and say, hey, can we... Do we have any updates on this? Can we merge this into 13 and then we repeat that for 14, no, we then we can't. repeat that for 15? Well, I thought that came up <laughs> just today. DDH, are we talking DD client? Someone just said, hey, there's a sign of life. No, no DHCP CD okay, last update one. was, or this is a very long. Okay. Yeah, but the, the thing is that the author Mm-hmm. Who is and I'm not joking. She's still alive because of the medical issues. I'm I'm really glad he's he's still alive. 
Yeah, okay. He, he, he had an update. Yeah, he had an update of the DHCPCD, which is still not in the review. But I know there's no movement there. And but so it would make sense the... to just use the ports word. Yes. And well, yeah, there's well, nothing wrong with really just really using easy. a port. What is? I I didn't get the DHCPD from boss working, but instead I use the ISC DH client and then just write my own uh, DH client exit hook to yeah. hook up the prefix allocation, things like that. We're just lazy and DHCPCD does everything so you can relax. Yeah. But, but no, course, not, not really everything. Uh, caps are come enabled uh, rather than running everything as root. Uh, so it has a lot <laughs> more uh, up to date design uh, with sandboxing and privilege so, separation. So, so help me to understand this. So, it, it's called the HCPv6, but it asks a router to give you a prefix that you can delegate. <laughs> but the, uh, 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 no, even more confusing. Jan, uh, can I can I take this yeah, one? Yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. I I just want to say like the naming. Is just terrible. No, no, no. It's Whatever. not just okay, the naming. On. The naming is a consequence. And uh, oh, when you grasp it all, uh, the naming is logical. <laughs> but the whole thing from the perspective of IPv4 uh, is weird. Uh, everything is kind of known, but not. Uh, let me give you a few examples. First, DHCP, well, what you think of a DHCP when you say dynamic uh, address allocation in IPv4, uh, you are saying the DHCP. But when you see it in the context of IPv6, there are three. RT uh, advertising, router advertising is one. DHCP, uh, how to say it, the normal DHCP, what you call for for IPv4, is another one. And uh, DHCP prefix delegation, which usually comes with a PD uh, as a suffix, is another one. So one of the quirks is that the second one, or what you thought of DHCP, doesn't give you the routing. Uh, it's not about routing at all. It's just about uh, IPv6 allocation and yeah. stateful. Uh, I mean, th there's a lot of talk I behind it. Uh, uh, yeah, but practically, if you want to do something today with a FreeBSD and uh, IPv6 and DHCP, uh, the the second kind, so to say, you will have to use router advertisement because the DHCP in IPv6 doesn't have that message yet. There is, uh, I think, RFC that is being worked on, but that option is still not implemented yet. Also, you will have a problem running it because some operating systems, namely Android don't have it implemented at all. They can uh, router solicitate, but not DHCP. So what, what I ended up running from as a dual stack is uh, almost a triple stack because you want uh, to get a router or a gateway from router advertisement daemon then you want uh, DHCP to maybe what I do, register my jails through DHCP and a Kirk and uh, NSD and whatnot. And then maybe you have you don't have a static IP, and then there's there's DHCP v6 PD. So the when you take all into accounting, naming is perfect actually. Uh, that, so, that's that's actually a joke. I mean, the naming is perfect, but the whole um, thing that even resembles naming in the IPv4, I think that 
at least to me, it was harder to to grasp. And there's there are features of IPv6 that you will think as, for example, ORP is not about MAC addresses. Well, well it's about gluing it. two yeah. namespaces together: the MAC address namespace and the IPv4 namespace. Yeah, and what what do you do with uh, IPv6? Most of them are actually IP addresses, and there are three um, groups of IP addresses in in IPv6, and they don't resemble what you think of when you say IP address in the context of IPv4, because one of them. Well, you will see it with a FE80 something, something, something. That's how you you probably route, meaning the, the, the full gateway when I say route, sorry. And uh, things are similar enough to be fooled that you know something and they're different enough that you don't even have to scratch the surface. When you look at the surface good enough, you're going to know you have no idea how it works. At least that's my my experience. So, so the, the, in the ad, IP address, you're not getting IP address for, from your uh, uh, IP provider. You're getting a prefix. In IPv4, you would call it an address range or a slash something. Well, here, usually slash 64. But it's not what you think. It's not an address. It's a bunch of addresses that your router has to fan out yep. somehow. And that fanning out is radically different than IPv4. So if you're confused, I hear you, my brother, and I share your pain, and I know how you feel. It's a really, really confusing once uh, until you grasp how how it actually works, and then, oh my God, who remembered this? Um, um, I disagree with your explanation. So... Okay. DHCP v4 <laughs> is a refinement of the older boot P and reverse art protocols, which did only give you an address and nothing more in the first case of reverse up and only an IP address in gateway and by boot in boot P because they assumed that you used classful networking. Then DHCP assigns you a single address, you get at least on the address. And it also tells you the address of your default router and a network mask. So you don't get the prefix things, you get the network mask and the... Uh, what about DNS? The, yes, that's an other option. That's, that's optional. Always optional. used okay. in production, but in theory, it's optional. You can have the DHCP yep. uh, acknowledgement and you don't get anything. You can yep. also put other useful things in there, like the EFTP server, server for yes, PFC, exactly. yep. the NTP server for time synchronization, and so on. IPv6 works a bit different. Rather than broadcasting it, you're using router advertisement or solidifications to ask for a router advertisement. And so the first thing is that you get your a router advertisement either because you asked for it or because you waited until the router periodically uh, multicasted it. And inside this thing, you have uh, a few flags and four of them are named with single letters. You have the managed address flag, you have the uh, other configuration flag, you have the, uh, I think, a link flag and the automatic flag. And uh, so the uh, L flag and A flag together tell you that the, you can uh, use the network path from the source address to infer your um, network prefix. And A flag tells you that it's fine for you to use stateless auto configuration to derive the host part for the uh, network part you learned from the source address. 
uh, if it's disabled, you wouldn't assign yourself a global address. Then you can have the M flag for managed, which in practice means managed using DHCP v6, which then means that you have to perform a DHCP v6 uh, um, request to request your uh, global address statefully using DHCP. Uh, and you get your host address, okay? But you can also have both, so you get multiple addresses. You get the stateless auto-configured one, which would already be enough for you to dial out to the uh, network. But maybe you want to have the host uh, reachable under a well-known address, which is put in some static lease in your DHCP server. And you don't want to put the static address in the host. So you use DHCP to assign this via DHCP so that you can have your network equipment its configuration be applied to the host automatically. And then there's the other flag which tells you to use DHCP v6, but only for other things like NTP, DNS, uh, whatever else you care for, but not for the address and not for the prefix, but just for the additional things you can't put in there. For example, uh, the boot uh, TFTP server can be delivered via DHCP v6 to a PXE uh, payload. But Take care, John. stateless addressing. Yeah. That's at least what I figured out over time and yeah. Okay, could both of you verify the minutes? I'm doing my best to keep up and this needs to be clear for the broader public. Thank you very much and we're making great progress here. The, the confusing thing which I still think is confusing is that DHCP v6 with prefix delegation is also for the DHCP server or relay, a routing protocol, because once it has delegated a prefix to the DHCP client, it has to change its routing so that this prefix is routed to the leaseholder. So if you were running a DHCP v6 prefix delegation server or relay, once the lease uh, is assigned, you also have to route the prefix you delegated to the DHCP client on your then trans uh, transit network. Uh, Michael, is that your keyboard that's uh, singing a song? Oops, sorry. About <laughs> <that>. <laughs> yeah, it's um, impressive. It sounds great. It's like those uh, uh, phone hold systems, pretending you're, there's a human there. Anyway, um, awesome. OK, do check my notes. Um, yeah. uh, this cannot be too clear, so I know that's challenging to say, and I'm at the mercy of folks like you. I do want to understand this. Um, so yeah, if anything, keep blogging. I, I think the feedback has been spectacular so far, and the more you can spell it out, the better. And Goran, don't take Jan's uh, counter explanation in any negative way. I hope you've both clarified one another successfully. Yeah. I think oh, you just speak? said it. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, sorry, you can. Yeah, go on. Go sorry ahead. for I'm being so, so pedantic. But... Oh, we, we love you for your pedanticness. Go ahead, go on. Uh, that's exactly what I wanted to say. He's more pedantic. <laughs> I just wanted to, to state out the biggest problem with IPv6 is coming from IPv4. If you think yeah. you know something, you don't know anything. One gave a good mental model to think how you would That's a good one. want to use it, but it's not precise enough to allow you to debug it, his explanation. Yeah. Well, technically, if you have a multi-home problem, um, I'm not sure if PF support NTP66 yet. 
uh, or NTP66 yet, but I know that IPFW does support NPT66. So you can yes. use that to uh, do the evil thing, which is netting IPv6, but it works. Network prefix translation NPTv6. Uh, MPT66 or MPT66. Oh, could you type that just for the old guy? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's supported in IPFW. Uh, OpenBSD PF at least uh, has stateful IPv6 not thing. And you can use it to either not uh, do different types, even one to many, nothing. Sorry. Uh, there's a podcast I learned a lot about IPv6 that I'm trying to remember. IPv6 bus? Uh, yes, IPv6 bus. Uh, from packet okay. pushers? Yes. 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 That was extremely useful when I learned about IPv6. Uh, I think the FreeBSD fork of PF lacks uh, IPv6 not support. It doesn't. It uh, not I, use it, I use it on Reggae because I want development drills. And mm -hmm. I don't want to mangle with your uh, with your network. That's why for the development uh, and IPv6, I have FD something something addresses. Yeah. Right, it's auto generated. The for the IPv4 uh, people, that means it's a private address. If it starts with FD. <laughs> It's not exactly Come on, the same. Jan, you don't, you don't no, have to be that strict. I agree. In with this you. case, I think I do because <laughs> the problem is as soon as you're dual stack, ULA addresses are no longer used because IPv4 is preferred over uh, un uh, unique locally assigned addresses. So the FC slash seven uh, isn't used, at least with the default. Uh, prefix uh, selection rules because IPv4 mm. will get used before this, which can be as long as your IPv6 only, they do get used as you expect them to. Um, yeah. It's... But basically we agree. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if the closest to a private network... What you can uh, also do is IPv you can have both. Yeah, I have actually three, unfortunately. Yeah. No, sorry. In the jail, I have both. Yeah. So you can have both your global and your ULA address, and potentially IPv4, and of course you always need link local. So yeah, you ha really have to let go of this IPv4 idea of one interface, one address. You will always have at least two addresses on a completely configured IPv6 interface. Yeah, the problem is that the, the terminology is similar and it kind of draws you yeah. to, to draw conclusions from IPv4 experience. Yes. I just wanted to say that Today, not today, this week, I configured WireGuard with Hurricane Electric. So I get a tunnel Wire from Hurricane Electric. They do so support that? Not really. So I get a tunnel from Hurricane <laughs> Electric. And then I add a WireGuard interface on my machine from that prefix. And now my laptop has IPv6, which nice. it usually doesn't in Armenia. And the same thing I did with my friends uh gentle machine as well and now we both can you know ssh into in, into each other's machines and i think that's been awesome blog um, post. it is going to be a blog post specifically because uh, <laughs> wireguard on mac has a bug uh i haven't pr that yet and wireguard or, or specifically wg quick on linux also has an ipv6 bug 
uh, both of them have two different bugs. Interestingly, WireGuard on FreeBSD doesn't on IP with IPv6 configuration has no bug at all. Um, well, it's a second iteration. <laughs> it, yes, we are on the second iteration. While Gen two <laughs> is on the first iteration of yes, so there you go. Yeah. Yes. Um, one tool I would recommend uh, you look into is zero tier for this use case. Yeah. Uh, because it really handles the use case of using all, uh, let's say, socially acceptable means of punching through uh, middle boxes to make a good attempt to get a direct... Uh, flow between each node on each network. And if not, it falls back to a very slow official proxy, but you can run your own if you want better uh, proxy bandwidth. Uh, I have to say uh, we've been very happy with Hurricane Electric, but I think that's a Armenia specific solution because they have servers in Amsterdam and we Armenia has a direct, very big link physically going into Amsterdam or from our IX into the European IX. Yeah, but so. it's still like 40 milliseconds or so at least, maybe 60? Uh, 60, 60 milliseconds. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Whereas yeah, something like zero tier would dynamically try to get a UDP flow between your local Armenian ISPs without oh, yeah, even yeah, leaving the country. So. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Ask DCH about it. Yeah. And for yeah. this. I, 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 I would love, access, by the way. It's just great. But I would love, that is better for a, the... I would love, by the way, a zero tier self hosted solution. Not, not, not a specific zero tier, but anything that is similar to zero tier would yeah, be. You awesome. can self host. You can run your own controller. Oh, you, you can't have to use controller. the official controllers. Is it inside the FreeBSD ports? The yes, it's, I think it's even, uh, it is. Uh, you can run your own. Even a Microtech router can run as a controller with no dependency on the external ones. You just have to tell your client, the, your other nodes where they can find their so-called moons. So the official ones are called planets. Yours are called mm -hmm. moons. And then, yeah. So I see zero tier in ports. Yes, it is. Obviously, yeah. Davy is the maintainer. Yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm not sure that I see the controller unless the controller and this is the same thing. I think you can just but... configure it to run. Well, if you want yeah. to use Telscale, uh, that's also a control serve open source yeah. control server implementation called Haskell. So. But ta but Taylor scale would do routing, right? So it would go to Taylor scales, uh, the the data center, mm. and then go out. No, uh, no. Just what, was that name Hath scale? What was the alternative? Yeah, Hath scale is the open source of. How's that spelled? Hath scale. The problem uh, with Hath scale is they have to. Scale. Head. Yeah, head scale. Yeah. Looks like the controller is part of the. Uh... Same repository. So maybe already part of the port. Interesting. Very interesting. I will I will look into that. Uh, and and you're saying running? that yes, sir. And I do you have a problem with Google and uh, <laughs> Hurricane? Do I have a problem with Google? Yeah, for example, I use Hurricane Electric uh, IP address mm -hmm. and it really doesn't like VPN alike access and Hurricane Electric is one of them. Uh, so I had to do a trick. Um, okay. When you ask for uh, Google's IPv6, when you try to access it, my PF is gonna not block drop, but block return, so that you, your program knows that it's forbidden right away. I mean, the, hmm. the, the package is dropped. And uh, 
because it gets multiple IP addresses asking who Google.com is or www.google.com, uh, is going to try a next one. And that next one is maybe IPv6 again and the uh, cycle repeats. But eventually it's going to get to the IPv4 address. Uh, eventually meaning few milliseconds, not like minute mm -hmm. or whatever. So that's what I have in my cron that I hate on a router. A PF table of all Google addresses that I use in a block return statement of PF. Okay. So if you run any, God forbid, email from it, I'm really interested to hear the the whatever's your experience. You can't run a mail server, uh, not an outgoing mail server on a cloud failure address. Um, because you will just get blocked everywhere. In that case, you would have to route your outgoing messages through some kind of the mail delivery as the spam delivery services. The mail is just the most obvious example, but whatever you have with the Google and uh, IPv6 obtained through tunnel broker, Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's like, I want to hear how you solve that one. I mean, what, what I described works only because my native address is IPv4 and I can fall back to it. But it, it's, a, it's a nightmare talking to Google with any service. And again, the mail is the most obvious one. So if if anyone has any experience with Hurricane Electric and anything Google, I'm all ears. I'm all ears anyway. Yeah, the the I can say is that uh, like almost a decade ago it used to work, and Google did not block them. So around with the IPv6 launch day and so on, but. <laughs> Yeah. So should we just start a bo 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 boycott Google movement at this point? You know, uh, maybe Google the only one. Me. Any uh, stream <laughs> legal streaming platform will kind of by necessity because their their uh, licenses require out of them uh, block these kinds of things like uh, how I can electric tunnel broker because you can use them to. Uh, change your location to a different licensing zone so that you could pretend to be in North America and then you could watch uh, U US only licenses. Yeah, yeah, that's how we play uh, games here. I don't yeah. know about you guys, but... <laughs> can you tie that to trails? Yeah. But what you can do is you can... Uh, is this rent? why this is called jail call? No, oh, yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I think we entered the parallel universe at this point. So, yes, this is a jail call. And, and we, we found a way to go to jail. This is good. This is good. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. The viewers of the... Like $200 of the, uh, go directly to jail. The voice, the, the views yeah. that are showed on this call do not. Uh, what was that big banner that they showed on Brian Cantrell's head at Usenix <laughs> when he was talking? Oh, it's his own opinion and does not represent the organizers. The free, the free the project like or Michael Dexter, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, the thing is that most of the time it's not against your local law to consume it, it's just that they are the provider is required to uh, not make it available to you, not that you're not allowed to consume it anyway. Uh, yeah, okay. I was thinking we should have some people just willingly share part of their home internet and we can have this mesh. But regarding mail delivery and stuff like this or not getting GOIP block and so on, what you can do is you can uh, rent uh, even a virtual server on this reputable enough hosting platform. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, some kind of co-location or something, or something which is not on the big uh, shit list of content delivery networks and so on, and uh, or mail policy database right. and, so on. and then you okay. can yeah. run your own uh, VPN there, for example, using WireGuard. And um, in a jail. So uh, I think course, we've exhausted uh, that topic and you are welcome to talk about your media accessing separately. Uh, that's your call. Uh, this, the problem is that, for example, it can happen to you if you are require to use some kind of tunnel to get IPv6 in your country because your ISPs are so backward that they refuse to acknowledge that IPv6 is a thing, then you have to use a tunnel broker or VPN provider and the ones available are, are to the general public are known to everyone. Interesting. That's a good point. It isn't about... Yeah some kind of evil stuff. It's just that at that point, there is no way for the legitimate content providers to defend against you using a new tunnel every few seconds to abuse their service, to run a denial of service attack, causing a lot of load on them and so on. So it's really an inherent conflict of interest and you can't easily just pretend that it doesn't exist to have to deal with it. Okay, on those prophetic notes, uh, lightning round, has anyone made a wine, Windows is non, wine is non emulator jail? Are there any good use cases for that? I mean, yes. the only use case in my mind would be to get Windows Active Directory running on free BSD, but is that <laughs> even possible outside of the field? You know, Does that no, have the I, resources I, to run AD even. I don't know. I the, the, I I need everything inside the jail because I need to detrace from the outside to the inside. Because that's <laughs> what my right. business rely, relies on, as you yep. know. So, okay. <laughs> if if anyone um, ever has a solution like that, we'd like to pay you money. Uh, wasn't there some experimental port by Microsoft of detrace to Windows? Supposedly, yes. That is not experimental. That is now in production, and yeah. we do use it. Okay, oh, you so do? Okay. Uh, the that problem is off is topic, that... but I definitely want to hear yes. more in some context. Yes. The, the only problem with that is that you do have to run Windows. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, okay, off topic. Um, um, for Back to your topic, yes. Uh, is, let's say I have an old game I really love playing, and I want to play it in Wine because it was yeah. only released to Windows. Yep. Yeah on my FreeBSD system, but I do know that none of the network code has been updated for a decade or longer. And let's say I want to play the something like StarCraft 1 Brute War. Uh, yeah. And um, I know that the maps are written using uh, memory uh, corruption exploits to extend the map uh, scripting with shell code. And yes, this does work. And you really so don't want to run this uh, outside of the jail. So you're saying and you so, can get your V4 networking in your game on your native IPv6 LAN. You could tunnel some kind of IPv4 overlay over IPv6. Okay. For example, you could use VX LAN to even have IPX uh, Oh, wait, I don't think uh, IPX is supported in FreeBSD anymore, but okay. <laughs> so you would have to do it in some kind of encapsulation user okay. using something like DOSBox, but uh, for more, uh, but at least you could have something like uh, if it, the, let's say, the matchmaking protocol for local uh, area gaming uses broadcast, you could really do a VXLAN. Uh, or some other layer two encapsulation between two FreeBSD systems, both running Wine inside the jail, that would work. Hmm. Okay, cool. Okay, don't use IPX, please. No, no. Ah, well, I heard something that sure sounded like that. Yeah, um, forget I mentioned it. That's fine. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, uh, so that would be a use case, but you to run Wine 
you would have to install a FreeBSD base system plus all the dependencies of support. Yeah. So it wouldn't be a special, really special jail. Oh, it would you only report be... it on package base for a small base, so that might help. Oh, you yeah, sure don't sure, need but... playing for your game. Thank you very much. No, but uh, relative to the game size, it may not matter. Okay. Depending on how old your game is. Well, speaking of that, Yes, I'm going off topic again. Please, actually, uh, the other way is to just use faster. So you so you kind of have the base system anyway, and then you can just install things on top of it, but it's still sharing the base. Did you say pass through? What did you say? No, Bastille. Oh, Bastille. Okay. Yeah. Yes, you can use nullfs trickery to uh, deduplicate your user land. And speaking of that, that's how some of my containers are built now. I just directly import Bastel as a container, and then I can mm. upload it to Docker and just use it. Well, CBSD also has team jails that's and uh, few, few nullifers mount points to achieve that. Mm -hmm. Or if you want, uh, if you are fine with staying immutable, you can also. Uh, clone snapshots read only and then only mount the right directory spiteable using dedicated data sets for them. I, I would really love if you update the uh, immutable parts uh, to newer snapshots because then you have to do some ZFS renaming in the right sequence to untangle and unnest them and renest them so that you can update a parent without uh, removing the uh, child data sets. I yeah. would really love Can that I... by the end of the year, if pot, bastial, CBSD, jailer, mm -hmm. XC. Did I miss anything about the ones that people actually use? Jailer.conf. Uh, speaking of which, is that on the <laughs> containers page? Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, actually, it's interesting because I see a really good progress with UI and Portman. Uh, so that could be an interesting way to go uh, because yes. that basically just take whatever Portman has. Uh, to make it more interesting is that whatever viewer build actually can consume by XC anyway. So I'm pretty happy about that. So, where were you headed with know. that? You wanted something to be there I by was... the end of the year? And I was headed to the place where uh, we could have two layers to work with each other. One of them is the one that you said, which is all of us be able to work with the OCI layers using Podman. Now that Podman works properly on FreeBSD, works properly less or so on FreeBSD. I mean, it, it, it works probably, you know, I mean, I, I did test it yesterday and I didn't have any issues, to be honest. That's but one layer. And, and it? Does it work on 14? Because TKG I actually cannot in the store get it. Man. Uh, I don't think it's on 14. Oh, not, not on 14. Sorry. We're, we're running release. So we're on 13.2. Okay, okay. Yeah. I, I, I ran the default Hello World of Docker and uh, it pulled the image and ran it as inside the jail and it all worked fine. I don't know anything about the networking yet. I have to dig into it. But that's one layer that we should like look into in order to be able to use all the awesome ecosystem things that and app jail. I remember and app jail. Yeah, so we can work with the awesome ecosystem things that uh, you know the Linux people have created, and maybe at the same time learning from their mistakes, we can start building our own ecosystem around our tools like OCI, but for us with our needs, um, instead of having tarballs, we can have, I don't know, ZFS snapshots, you know, or, or whatever, yeah. or packages. I still think, yeah, yeah. I still think like uh, tarball is the right way to do it, especially I know that there yeah. are development of, for overlay FS for previous anyway, and there's, there's just many things that a ZFS snapshot cannot do over tarball. Unfortunately, so yeah, that that that's correct, man. I agree. I agree. I absolutely agree. But 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 I mean, um, we can see, we see that App Jail and Bastille have a very good community. Even their Telegram channels are very active. 
uh your what's your docker file uh you know uh what do you call that so, alternative i have an xc thing and uh yes it, it yeah an xc has a thing called jail file but jail file, what's yes. funny is that i'm actually going to rework it a little bit because mm -hmm. uh let's put it this way xc has some pretty unique features so i have to okay. kind of have uh, other format to cope with that but anything you build right. with portman uh, anything you build that's OCI, XC can just consume it. Okay, got it, got it. Because because my question was gonna be um, of jailers ones. I haven't published it yet. It's been I started to clean up some stuff. Um, but my question was so when you I remember you demoed how you were running a Docker image, right? Yep. But these Docker images usually not always usually they require System D or am I wrong? I I still don't get how they work. Uh, they don't. The way the Docker image works is like a huge portion. I think like over sixty percent of them does not require SystemD. What they do is that they just uh, run the binary in the sandbox. Basically, that's the idea. The ones that requires it are usually trying to do something more complicated, such that they do need a supervisor or such things like that. Um, something like the Amazon. Elastic Storage Client, uh, ESC, ECS, or something like that, they do require a system D to run inside. But many of the times, uh, they actually don't use system D, but use something called, I actually forgot the name, but that's like a lightweight init that built for Docker. Uh, in those cases, right, those images usually won't work, but a lot of the image just don't depend on them. Um, yeah, for 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 those images, it would just work just fine. Uh, I see. Yeah, I see that that makes sense. Because because in my blog post, I mean the main the main thing that I learned is that you know uh sys v i mean sys sys v uh r c sorry sys v what was it sys v in it sys v in it. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, on 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 dev one, it, it works fine, but it just throws some random errors. So I was like, eh, let's not let's not use that. But with with open RC, everything's working flawlessly, you know. Yeah, and, <laughs> yeah, and and my scientists don't even you know see it as a Linux machine, except that some of their quote unquote pipelines rely on Docker. And they don't even know that it relies on Docker. They're like, oh, I'm running this Conda script or I'm running this NF next flow script. But in reality, it's actually calling Docker. And that's obviously it's going to crap because Linux doesn't know it's on FreeBSD. And Docker mm -hmm. is complaining because it cannot open slash sys slash cgroup slash yeah, fs or slash fs slash cgroup. Linux yeah. container. So yeah. yeah, that's a problem with... I, I don't know. It must be a really complicated Docker... Uh, container to to need those kind of things. Uh, yeah, yeah. So in in those cases, we, if we don't have C groups, obviously we, we just can't support it. That that's unfortunate, but you mm -hmm. know that that's just the reality. Um, yeah. So some some tiny you... some tiny things we might be able to work around it. Uh, but like if it's in that scale and interdependent, we probably can't. And other concern is that some container is really weird. Some container is like they built in a way that defeat the whole purpose of the container. Uh, especially yeah. those required you to bind months a Docker socket into a container such that that container can use Docker. Oh no. Nextcloud does uh, that. Nextcloud official image does that. Okay, does what? It does it? Because uh, my I can run the Nextcloud uh, Docker image just fine. So, uh, but maybe some feature of Nextcloud and needs that. Yeah, so in, in those cases, it would be really annoying, but it's not totally undoable. Uh, we just need to imp we implement uh, all the uh, HTTP, uh, HTTP call Docker is using and just mimic the Docker layer, but I highly does not recommend it because I, I, I think that's going to be more problematic uh, compared to the problems solved. I absolutely agree. I, we, we tried doing that on Elixir. We did just the basic. It's massive. It's not the Docker API is not small. It's very big and it does a lot of things. It even does like R Logan, basically, you know, over the Docker API. Yeah. It's, it's, so it's, it's crazy. Yeah. So yeah. it's been very hard there. Um, yeah, Michael, uh, so, sorry, not uh, not the not the Docker uh, image of Nextcloud, but rather the Nextcloud AIO. Which oh, is yeah, called okay. oh, yeah, okay. 
and I'm a colleague is using it. So what sin does it commit? So the sin that it commits is that the container, the, the, the next cloud AIO that is running inside Docker yeah. is 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 using the the next cloud uh, the Docker socket that is on the host. So now your container is managing other containers. Yes. Not not but is, not inside of it. Hideous. Next to it. Yeah, I think on this topic I can share a feature of XC, but that's kind of like not entirely in media. So in XC, you can actually create different channels. Uh, a channel, it, it basically means it's an other unit socket that uh, XC is listening to. But the cool thing is, uh, what I'm deciding to do is that each channel, you can attach a different profile such that you can say, I'm creating extra unit socket to some location, but this unit socket uh, can only do certain things or can only see um, certain containers. Michael? So that's yeah. that's kind of mitigating the Docker, uh, sharing Docker socket issue. Assuming you don't have uh, any qualms about further relying on free BSD uh, only features. Yes. There is an interesting uh, detail. If you uh, f start a file descriptor to an anonymous pipe, just what the pipe system call gives you, uh, the first time it gets a unique um, pair of file system ID and inode number allocated, which will be valid for the entire lifetime of this pipe and preserved the course inheritance and file descriptor passing. It's lazily allocated the first time you start it. It uses basically uh, one less than the root file system as file system ID and a unique inode number, which doesn't correspond to a real inode and a real file system, but it can still be used if someone then sends you this pipe as a file descriptor on a socket, you can compare two pipe file descriptors for equality so that you can basically have someone pass around the pipe file descriptor as a capability and then hand it back on it some API socket and tell you, yeah, by the way, here is the file descriptor proving that I have the token authorizing me to use this API. I actually thought of that, and I actually, well, I didn't use the FSA approach, I used a more, much easier approach, but not actually for uh, communication. I, I use it for uh, determining if I can copy a file in. Uh, so, but mm -hmm. the FSA part is interesting, if I can just compare the I know number to say if it's the same. It only uh, works so. for files, directories, and pipes. Okay, so it does not work for sockets and friends. No, like sockets do not have a valid inode number. Yeah, I was I was curious. I, I think well. except for Unix domain, sockets bound to some place in a file system. But then the, the basically what's possible is that the, the socket outlives the lifetime of its name. So the inode number, mm -hmm. I think, can be reused if the socket is still there and in use but unlinked. I see because then there is no inode corresponding to the socket anymore. Hmm. Um, Interesting. And you can what? have sockets created using socket pair or TCP sockets, which of course don't have an inode number. Mm -hmm. They do have, but you aren't really supposed to access this and trust it, the address of the socket inside the kernel, but it's a privileged information you can't rely on. Yeah. Well, what I am relying on for the channel implementation is that uh, I would just have the the daemon listen mm -hmm. to that socket and has its own run loop, and that run loop is bound to a capacity, basically. Capacity. So when capability. They, well, not really capability. Right. So the I well, but it's not capacity, right? It's just mm -hmm. like the general mm -hmm. idea, such that if yep. they say, if I get a request from that channel to say I want to list a contain list some containers. I just show the containers that they are allowed to see, for example. Um, so, uh, so that's so, kind of like a constrained version of the Docker socket. What you can also do is you uh, can just use an empty log file. Basically, that will also that's not even uh, FreeBSD specific because, of course, a file in the file system has a unique 
inode number and every file system has a unique mount point. So at least files, excluding hard links, can be uniquely identified by the pair of file system mount point ID and inode number. Yeah, but if they can connect to their socket, that means they can write that socket, right? So I only need to handle the listening side. I don't have to uh, deal with anything Mm. on the file system. Yeah, but so for example, you could just say uh, you have to put a file in this directory or you can just use file system permissions on the directory containing the bound socket. Mm-hmm. And the other thing I kind of wish we can have, but I think it's just very hard to do, is that it would be really cool if we can have a mount system call that takes a, a directory descriptor or something like that. Yeah, uh, there you... I've thought about it, but it really... Um, but it's hard because it's the VF, VFS layer you need to no, kind of traverse the path. So so... Do you want to mount a file descriptor as an LFS like thing? No. Or no, do you want, want to, to take the... I want the to be able to file have the client image. open the directory as an FD mm-hmm. and then send over and then I can mount it. Okay, yeah. So you basically want to have the source of a nullfs mount uh, as a directory file descriptor. Uh, yeah, basically. Basically, it's like mount, like the, that's the, the source instead of the source being a path, <laughs> the source being a file descriptor. Yeah. That would be something really cool. But obviously, could, mount itself uh, is really hmm. special. Because, yeah. Uh, not all file systems expecting a path as a source. So yeah, the problem is that the end mount system call requires a path. Exactly. You could kind of, uh, get creative with the slash def slash fd prefix, which canonically references a file descriptor by yeah, its I kind of try not to do something too hacky and God knows what's going to happen. So, uh, but that would but be so far, it's, it's, it's doing kind of okay. um, unholy hackery on the already uh, fragile virtual file system. Yeah, I try to not do too much, you know, too but, fragile things because I want it to be somehow production ready. Uh, a better way we this. could get there is through something like uh, the 9PFS from Beehive. Uh, I don't, yeah, yeah, so I'm not sure about that. I have a 9P client and server connected, basically speaking, 9P over a Unix socket connection, then mounting this. Or you could, or maybe modifying NFS to work over um, of use or something, yeah. kind of thing. I, I think so far it is nice to have uh, something can rely on FD and mm-hmm. keep, uh, and maybe it's going to do but, nothing. But I think the wait, performance over everything just doesn't really work. I it. have an idea uh-huh. of what you can do. You can yeah. have a socket to ask a, a connection to a demon to the outside, and you basically tell it, I claim that this directory file descriptor and this path on the host are the same, and you're supposed to oh, mount that for that. me. Yeah. I'm already doing that. I compare the inode number. So yeah, the exactly. idea is you compare that... The, the... Uh, yeah. You so the idea the... is that the client need to open the third FD and then they need to submit the third FD with the path. Mm-hmm. And then the daemon will open the path and compare if the item yeah, is the you same. Would have to but the have... issue is you have race condition there. No, you don't. You have some race condition because by the time the daemon need to open that uh, directory, someone else might have mapped something on top of it or like um, it has to be what happened under is some that other hold on demon... let him finish so, go ahead uh, um, the, yeah what you yeah, can do of... oh yeah go ahead sorry <laughs> so, what you can do is you can uh, use open with uh, old directory to enforce that you're on not opening anything but a directory opening a directory won't really harm your process 
state and afterward you can f start it to compare it against the uh, file system ID and inode number you expected to find. So if someone did it, you can detect it. And once you have the, it, yeah, okay. If someone after this check comes in again with the right permissions on the host, there is a race condition. But at that point, it's basically root uh, fucking itself over. But you can defend well enough against anyone but the super user on the host. That, that is assuming we don't have the uh, non-super user VFS mount things. Uh, um, you, know, you can't so... mount over directories you can't write to. In that case, if you... Yes, yeah, true, but that directory can under some other directory. You know what I mean? So it's, it's Then you have, your, a pretty... have a bigger problem. So yes, that's, that's why the non-atomic nature of it is, is the yeah, main path -based issue. API it's not is really that... Tech. It's not really the fact that you cannot check it. It's that the fact that you check checking it, you kind of run into yes. this really, you, you can really likely run into this race condition. Yeah. Those are edge cases, but they can happen. So, yeah, in this case, I would yeah. argue that it's not really a big problem. But you're right. This is a time of check versus time of use problem. But I would argue only against the super user unless you have badly misconfigured your system. Mm -hmm. And in a case where it's maybe not a problem you expect to run into, yeah. it's more yeah. like you have to present a confused deputy problem where your privileged mounting service on the host could be uh, exploited from inside the guest by tricking it to expose the wrong thing to your uh, jail. That's yeah. the attack vector and, I wanted to defend yeah. against. Another issue that's not quite direct is that let's say you have an unprivileged user, he owns a directory, but yes. somehow someone else put a file that the user does not suppose to read into that directory. Now, yeah. because the user can mount that directory into a jail, the uh, user, whoever can mount that directory, can kind of indirectly read the file because inside the jail, <laughs> Uh, he yeah, is per mount point. Yes, so that is also some problem we can really solve without uh, proper UID, GID mapping. Yeah, that would be nice to have. Uh, basically, a null FS with uh, kind of block based rename, uh, basically, this bias to this range for groups so that you don't have to modify the file system using some kind of VFS, null FS like thing. And I think this existed in FreeBSD 5 and 6, maybe 4, but was removed in 7 when the VFS was moved out from under the giant block. Hmm. But we had this on thing until 2006 or 7, uh, uh, oh, UNET FS or something it was called. It What's came the up in this, these calls. What was the name it of was... the UFS? UMAP FS. UMAP FS or something, and it's basically the same mechanism uh, used inside NFS to remap root and wheel. Hmm. And you could con provide it with a config file, and it hasn't been exposed. Yeah, to someone, someone, someone make this to be a want to have project for someone else. Yeah, to this is something that would I be think great. it was called this. Yeah, we really kind of need that to have some proper uh, yeah, um, container-like yeah. workflow support. Um, and just man, FreeBSD org, okay, let me check the FreeBSD 6 something manual pages. Yeah, but anyhow, yeah, that's what we, uh, yep. Yeah, Mount so... UMAP FS, that is uh, the last release containing this. I uh, found the link to the open end page. Yeah, we'll go ahead and post yeah, that. Let me ch drop it into chat here. Yep, yeah, please. Thank you. This is what we used to have, but which was removed because giant lock uh, and nobody wanted to bring it forward. Hmm. And it allowed you to have an 
amount like NullFS that uh, we map UIDs and GIDs using a map file. Goodness. So this functionality existed once upon a time. I don't. We had nice things. And we had. That's I had, but basically, we, we, it can be restored. Yeah. By yeah. someone, uh, I don't know. By someone who have too much time. <laughs> but the, this would enable us to um, keep the images you run in your jails and then just mm, allocate a UID and GID group. That's the next thing you really would have to have is that, yeah. Then the jail runs with alternative mappings. You just change the group and uh, password files mm -hmm. in the jail instead of change owning and change grouping every uh, file in the container, which completely duplicates this and breaks any kind of deduplication with nullfs snapshots clones whatever you have you break it by at least by yeah, yeah. that's a good one. Oh my god the menu page is older than me <laughs> okay yeah that's brilliant okay um, that said, I, we're at two and I'm pushing two and a half hours. I've got a hard stop at just before three hours. Uh, Jan, is that a good segue to either your comments yes. on the NLFS, uh, so the, PRs the or to the of... thing you led with about the J exec via file descriptor into a jail that Antronik nudged yeah. you into clarifying for us slow people. Can you okay. at least give the us the most human that... ELI five summary of that? <laughs> I can't really, I can't show you best. Um, the API I'm work, I'm playing with right now is some, what look something from C. Let's just uh, what looks something like this. Um, so what I have and what does work is this. So basically, this is well. and then you do something along these lines. And I've, the problem is that yeah. I, the commented outline doesn't work for reasons. Because right, uh, there's a safety feature in the FreeBSD kernel, which does not uh, allow a process uh, containing a directory file descriptor to attach to a jail. So I have to uh, use a unique socket to take with me into the jail during attachment and then uh, use the Unix socket to pass the file descriptors after the process has uh, attached to the jail to bring them in. What this does is that it basically, it allows me to take an executable from the host and have it be linked after it potentially has dropped privileges and attached to a jail. And only then does it run the host's runtime linker against the host's executable using the host's library directories to find the libraries. Good Lord, could you type that? My head exploded. <laughs> <laughs> In that case, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Just uh, uh, ask some of your family to clean up after they stop exactly. screaming. Uh, yes. <laughs> sorry. Uh, dark humor is just like food. Not everyone gets it. Um, um, uh, sorry. Anyway. Okay. So uh, one can refer to the recording for that and put it in slow motion to catch so, the exact um, phrasing. Or you can drop it in there. Or if that makes perfect sense to you, say, uh, uh, Michael Lontronig and Goran, we're good. Don't shoot the messenger. Yeah. Anyway. But uh, this, so basically why I'm bothering with this is maybe that's the most important part, which I should have led with, is that it allows a very stripped down jail to be VNet enabled because rather than patching each network command to be jail aware and attach itself, 
or to have to install all the commands if config route and so on uh, it just allows the host to spawn a command with the right file descriptors as the right file descriptors standard in standard out standard error uh, maybe even something else inside the jail so that it can have have some let's say rf config on a jail which contains only a single other executable like only uh, engine x is in there with nothing else or only ha proxy and only the library is required by ha proxy so, so uh, even if someone gains execution in there and manages to do something they are a non-super user in a jail with none of the useful executables and libraries around. Or you have a Linux jail and there is no FreeBSD route on FreeBSD IF config installed. Or you have a 32-bit ARM jail on a 64-bit ARM CPU where you can't have both installed into a single user land because there is no lib32 for ARM. And now you can still use the host commands for networking stuff and just have route, set, fib, and whatever you need. Uh, just be, be linked and then run inside the jail without having to install them in the jail at okay. all. In the jail, you have a link to the command on the host. Is that no, correct? No, you don't. Or less or what? Nothing. What, nothing. The jail the... is empty. You can have a jail with just an empty root directory and run a command inside of it, which is installed on the host. How is the shell finding that so, command? There is no shell. Uh, I can't, well, I can't you can't use a is. shell in there because the, you, while you could bring up the shell, you could only use the build okay. because even something like ls would be the jails ls because that's, again, okay. a form. So you manage access. it from the host. So, you're yes. executing so commands the way... Yeah, so they, the way how it works is that you run the process, so the process already exists in, at the host, okay. and you use the jail attach system call and then move the process to the jail. So now the process yes. is in the jail. That's so just everything you run, Hold on, let him finish. Yeah, so everything you run will be running in the jail, but traditionally, this has a huge problem with uh, process uh, with executable that needs dynamic linking. Because dynamic linking happens after the uh, process init get called. So um, Jan's solution is basically solving the uh, dynamic, dynamic linking problem by also opening all the required uh, dynamic libraries. Linker directories. Linker directories. Uh, library directories. Yeah, by opening first before enter the jail, such that you are still probably load all the dynamic things and then you enter the jail and run the thing things. I'm going even further because Keep what I'm coming. doing is I'm opening the host's runtime linker as a file descriptor read only. I'm opening the executable as a file descriptor read only. I'm opening the linker directories uh, as read only directories. I'm setting the, an environment variable telling the Runtime linker, the runtime linker of the host I hold as a file descriptor later on to use the list of directories as file descriptors and to take the executable image from a file descriptor. So I'm basically, I'm delaying even the runtime linker loading to after I have done whatever I want to do, be it just switching around file descriptors, dropping privileges or attaching to a jail or all of that. And then the linker I'm holding a file descriptor to is exec by the kernel using f exec ve. And this runtime linker gets a argument list, which it strips its first part of instructing it to link an executable from another file descriptor. So oh, I can have a jail with no runtime linker inside of it. An empty jail, and I can run an, um, a dynamically uh, linked host binary inside of it.
and I know this is going to sound a stupid question, but this means it's only going to be binaries, right? Not like shell scripts. Well, the problem with a shell script is that a shell script will use normal fork and normal yes. exec to yes. exec commands from um, its file system. So bin sh will look for ls in slash bin con whatever its slash bin is. So you can run the host's bin sh, but the moment you type ls, it will run the jail's ls. But it would this cool. isn't that useful. But for uh -huh. something like Python or yes. other inter or Lua or something, you yes. could run uh, the script by having the linker and so on pass along the script to be executed as a file descriptor as well. And as long as the script in something like let's say F Lua, um, so now you don't even in need F Lua a, inside the jail. Get one more file descriptor, but the linker has to tell the interpreter, let's say F Lua, it brought in that um, it's supposed to read the source from some path. So you have to mount the file descriptor file system fdeskfs to the canonical path slash def fd, and then interpreters work. But the moment the they do touch something, uh, it's a path in its current uh, context, def fd. Yeah. So um, referencing a file descriptor using the fdesk fs works fine because you can bring that with you, assuming that uh, def fd is mounted. But you can't, uh, for example, rely that some Python module is installed. And I don't think Python out of the box brings away of well, doing this. You may be able to get around with, with some of these things with things like Vasi runtimes or something, where you basically compile your code to Vasm and then bring your dependency in as a Vasm bytecode. That may be possible, but it's really not the point why I'm looking into this. It's that something like the pot jail manager right now, they, if you have a minimal jail, they write out a startup script into slash TMP invoking IF config route and so on to bring up the guest VNet which is a problem because they can't use the full RC if they want to use the pot jail driver because the jail has to basically end in exec your command. And yeah, uh, it's a jail manager, not a mail manager. <laughs> <laughs> that's an other, uh, le that's the next level uh, down uh, in hell. <laughs> Ah, anything but, else on that topic? Yeah. So the idea is that no, but we cannot can, wait for it. Can inject commands uh, into the managed jails. Uh, yes, my config dash j and root dash j actually is in the base, so that's an hmm? alternative. I think that's fairly recent. It, it's not in fourteen dot two. It's not in fourteen dot two, but it's in fourteen. Yes, but. The problem with that is it's also going to be added, I think, to route. But let's say you need set fib to set the routing table you want to use inside the VNet jail. Oh, no, so, those that stop, I understand. I it just means like instead of for just some of the adding it to every command. No, I know, I know, this. but I agree with you. I'm just, I'm just adding extra yeah. information, say, in case someone we looking at this recording. We yes. do have oh, a way to do sorry. it. Yeah. Mm. Exactly, but uh, that relies on the host being uh, FreeBSD 14. Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't know why that's not uh, MFC to 13.2. Uh, or because maybe, it's oh, wait, newer maybe than 13.2, the uh, yeah, commit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
maybe MFC to stable and then become part of 13.3. But I think the commit is newer than the 13.3 uh, uh, two uh, release. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Okay. We have covered a lot of ground. Please keep yes, documenting these wonderful things. They are great. Antrenik, I hope you get electricity. Uh, Jan, thank you for commenting on those two open tickets. It looks like you made some, uh, well, questions on the second one and your just facts here on this one. Hopefully that no, will not be the ended with a question of what even should yeah, be the okay. correct behavior. Uh, because the problem is that I was afraid that for security's sake, Someone would recommend a patch that just disables um, passing this type of file descriptor or something, which would um, so that you couldn't use Unix sockets to pass file. The most extreme case uh, would be to close the whole can of worms by just preventing jails from passing file descriptors across jail boundaries or something. Oh, yeah. Which would really be a big loss. Uh, yeah. Well, I think we just okay. Let, let's say the jail um subsystem is actually pretty flexible. Technically, we can add just add different allow there to make it work. Yeah. Similarly, the that's the similar situation. I think we can do to Wagga. We can have the Wagga kernel module to check for the uh the ucred and then see. Uh, if the jail are uh, allowed to dump uh, wireguard config, something like that. So yeah, those are, just I think, have... the thing we can just add to, uh, because because jail, uh, because the jail uh, subsystem does allow you to specify your custom allow mm -hmm. calls in different kernel module. Mm -hmm. So I think the right thing is to handle those properly. Or maybe like to have everyone when they develop a new kernel module, to consider what what functionality they can optionally turn on or off in the jail. Uh, with regards to WireGuard, I would recommend doing it via an allow because you can have multiple WireGuard interfaces and so on. So a single allow oh, yeah. setting but for the that, whole that jail be wouldn't be good enough. It should it. be a property on basically the wire, just a new setting to configure on WireGuard interfaces per interface, yeah, I think, which you know, basically say, uh, let's say uh, list or the ID of a VNet allowed to uh, do super user operations. I'm thinking more that I don't. I haven't read the uh, if uh, WG, but I think what can what possibly can do is that when we store a config, we can also store the jail ID from the Ukraine. Uh, technically, jail ID can be directly specified, but let's ignore that for now. What happened is that when we dump the thing, we mm -hmm. can kind of filter to say, hey, this uh, config is created from a different yeah. context, so don't dump that. Don't dump that. Then the further uh, wireguard config added by the user will have the same mm -hmm. gel ID as the original one. So those yeah. are not affected by the allow cost. But, yeah. But, yeah. You we really need one more interface property for WireGuard to specify optionally at least that only this VNet is truly privileged on this WireGuard or maybe its creation basically restrict the super user privilege to my creation VNet would be enough probably. Just that mm -hmm. if you set hand it to another VNet, you can destroy it using IF config, but you can't dump the pre shared keys and private key, and you can't change the configuration. Please check my minutes, I beg of you. I will paste them in the chat. And please, if you have a moment, look at a document I crafted that's been about 10 years in the making on quiescing various things in OpenZFS. I will show you briefly what's going on there. 
but the idea is I've looked at how you should properly quiesce, say, Postgres on ZFS and MySQL and SQL Lite, and then we could look at containers, yes. but not today, as in flush all open buffers to disks such that if you take a snapshot in OpenZFS, I guess I buried the lead there. So primarily about, about say, hey, I know Windows Server and Hyper-V have their own mechanism for using either shadow copies. They say, hey, VM, go ahead and flush all out. And we'll snapshot you. Have a nice day. Um, and I've just brain dumped there. So if you can do some brain dumping, awesome. Yes, Jan. One of the nice things about ZFS is that each snapshot is atomically between two writes. So that you yes, as long as your bits. data, yeah, yeah, correct. As long as your database flushes what it needs to flush to disk or no, your no, virtual no. machine or you name it, no. At least something. Let's say Postgres. If you snapshot it and it's one data set and not the log and the uh, rest of a database on different file systems. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole snapshot is an atomically consistent view of the data set, which mm -hmm. means that Postgres will always reliably recover the latest committed transaction. You can just take it. Of course, you have to run the recovery, but you have to plan for that anyway. Right. So it's fine to just take snapshots and replicate them as backups. Of a running, you don't even have to do the PG start backup. Uh, don't do really? the task PIO, just take a snapshot. It same for um, MySQL so you... and uh, SQLite on uh, say, unless your database is this is on several data sets. Let's say for performance reasons, you have one data set with the um. 8K block size for the uh, 8K record size for the um, Postgres database, oh, but wow. you have one with 128K one for the uh, log files, the val files, mm -hmm. so WL files. Yep. So, um, which can make sense, but then just snapshotting it is no longer guaranteed to be atomically consistent, and you have to do the song and dance routine. But as on a per file system level, it's no worse than running something like uh, reboot dash Q or something. Mm -hmm. Just if you can join Thursday, great. Uh, that's a topic I'd like to bring up and just get people but, to share their wisdom. And if and if it's you know it's never been clear when exactly you'd want that, so that's precisely what I why I want to have this conversation. You want that uh, for exactly the example you brought? If you use want to take an async tar or whatever mm -hmm. file system or oh, file level backup instead of file system yep. level backup. Amen. Okay. Hold yeah. that thought till Thursday if you can join. Yes, yeah. Michael. I think Michael, it's interesting that you mentioned about like creating Postgres database and MySQL uh on set of S. Uh it's kind of funny because on XC there's a feature called volume hint basically allow you to attach different volumes and the desired uh, set of S properties as hints. So you can consistently just use it to create a data set for the databases, and then you automatically attach with the um, set of S properties. So you have a, a set of a profile of properties you apply, it sounds like? Yep, so basically you can say you have a volume uh, in the gel file, the, the uh, syntax is at volume and then dash dash uh, uh, hint. And then you can say set, for example, set of s.8 time equals to off or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so basically uh, the idea is that then when you need to create a date, uh, data set for this volume, then uh, we can get the hint from this uh, manifest and then it will create the optimal um, data set for the database, Great. all things like that. Love it, exactly, you're thinking, I appreciate it. <laughs> that said, uh, let's call it good and I hopefully will see some of you tomorrow. It, instead of a Beehive developer call, it'll be open ZFS production, yeah. simply because okay. that probably certain can Beehive developer has uh, not been showing up. Go ahead. I probably can join for this week and the next two weeks. Uh, I'm going for a road trip. Nice. Well, safe travels. Mm -hmm.
Okay, well, thank you, everyone. I'd like to call it. I've got a, a, a meeting on the hour. I wish all right. you all a great week. I wish you a great road trip. I admire your endurance on these calls.